that we are recording today's webinar so if you uh, you should be aware of that and we will be posting this uh, webinar on the music website for future reference as well for other people that might want to be interested and, and know more about uh, the topic um, yes, we have uh, 32 different countries represented, hopefully, and some of those lie well beyond Europe. So we have hopefully colleagues here from the US, uh, Kazakhstan, possibly from Thailand and Armenia and Canada, as well as Israel. So um, we should have a wide variety of time zones represented. So I do appreciate um, uh, the difference in times for some of you who are attending today. But it's great to see you all. Thank you for coming. Now, um, just to break the ice, we have a few questions that we'd like to ask you, and Elen is going to um, do some uh, digital wizardry with Zoom and going to pose some questions using the polls. So our first question is, what is your position in your organisation or institution? So please click away if you are a student or management or QA officer or an international relations coordinator, a teacher or other. So hit, hit the button, hit the button, and we'll have a look at the results in a moment. Okay. okay. <laughs> Share it in one second by Linda. Yeah. No problem. I feel like a game show host. <laughs> Elen, shall we go on to question two or, and look at the, the results altogether? Yeah, okay. So our question two is how familiar are you with quality assurance? And the top answer is I am a quality assurance guru. And there might be some of you in there who are gurus, absolutely. Or you might be an aspiring quality assurance nerd. I count myself, I think, amongst those. I'm a knowledgeable quality assurance initiate or I hardly know about quality assurance but want to learn. So please let us know your degree of familiarity with quality assurance. So you choose if you're a guru or a novice. And finally, uh, the third question you can see at the bottom there, what is your opinion on quality students? I find it very bureaucratic or I see its benefits or I love working in this field. Okay, have you all had a chance to answer now? So let's see what the results are like then. Elen or Linda, if you could share the screen, that would be fantastic just to see how we're all doing. Okay, let's see. So the majority of you are uh, working in the management of quality assurance in your various institutions, and that's great. Uh, or a quality assurance officer. We've got a few students here, that's great. Thank you so much. It's really important that we have students here today. Thank you. And we have some teachers as well, which is really good. Uh, how familiar are you with quality students? Well, the majority of you say that you are initiates or novices, so that, that's good. Thank you very much. A few of you, nevertheless, are gurus, so we'll expect to hear a bit more from you later on. Thank you for that, for sharing that. And uh, the majority of you, again, see the benefits of Q8. Well, phew, I'm glad about that. That's why we're all here. Okay, so let's to, to learn more about Q8 then, uh, let's, let's push on. I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, and uh, that is our very good colleague, Tia Lokola. Tia has a distinguished career in university administration, quality assurance and policy in higher education, first at the University of Turku in Finland and for the last 13 years at the European University Association, where she has recently been appointed as Deputy Secretary General. Congratulations, Tia, on your appointment. Tia, we look very much uh, forward to hearing you speaking. So over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for the kind introduction and for the invitation to be here today. I'm trying to share my screen. I think it should work. I see some nodding. Um, so I am afraid that I might be boring some of the quality assurance nerds and gurus here today, but I will start from the beginning and then the next speakers will go more into perhaps more interesting novelties and so on. But let's see how, how we got here, where, where, where we have been in, in the European quality assurance. I would start by the, trying to answer the question, what is quality assurance? 
And we often see in uh, policy documents uh, or expectations uh, towards higher education that we need to have quality assurance. People like to say uh, quality assurance should do this and that, quality assurance, we need quality assurance. But what do we really mean? It's not necessarily um, easy to answer. And what we see at European uh, level is that uh, we understand quite different things uh, by when we talk about quality assurance. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of different aspects. Um, in particular, in the uh, let's say when I got into the quality assurance, we talked a lot about just quality assurance. And then we got confused because some of us were actually talking about external quality assurance and some of us internal. Nowadays, I think we, we use these two adjectives quite often in front of quality assurance. External quality assurance is what the quality assurance agencies do. Uh, they come to the university and or higher education institution and check what the institution is doing. Whereas internal quality assurance is the, is the responsibility of the higher education institution itself. And we have uh, one of our common principles in Europe, at least, is that internal quality assurance is really basis of, of the whole quality assurance infrastructure that we have in place. When some of us want more quality assurance, they may want uh, ex uh, institutional or program level external quality assurance. I think uh, my fellow speaker will talk more about differences here. Uh, similarly, the purposes are very different. If you go to one, uh, one system or one institution, they say, oh, quality assurance is about assuring the minimum standards. It's about accountability. Whereas then in the other one say, no, 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 no. It's about enhancement, how we improve our activities. Um, and then the focus of the quality assurance also varies. Um, in some systems, we, we think that quality assurance only refers to education, whereas in others, it may uh, refer to a wider spectrum of institutional activities. However, what we see it being common is that it is about peer reviews. It, it's, in higher education, it is about peers providing uh, uh, weather decisions or um, uh, evaluations. So uh, quality assurance really got started in the 80s and 90s when the first external quality assurance agencies were created and their collaboration started. It's often linked to the massification of higher education uh, when we look at the different uh, uh, literature. Um, it's been a policy line in the Bologna process since 2003. And that's why quite often when we talk about quality assurance, we talk about education because the focus of Bologna process is education. And uh, while it was a policy line until 2018, nowadays we, in the Bologna process, we talk about uh, it being one of the key commitments in, in the Bologna process. So if you hear that kind of wording, uh, the other key commitments are qualification frameworks and ECTS, and then uh, recognition in line with Lisbon Recognition Convention. So when we talk about the key commitment for quality assurance at, in Euro at European level, there is a one key document that we refer to, which is the standards and guidelines for quality assurance in the European higher education area. A shorter version that you may have heard of is European Standards and Guidelines. And then even shorter version is the EST. Currently, we are working with the second edition of the EST, uh, which is from the year 2015. It covers three parts. Uh, it has one set of standards for institutions to work with. How the, does the internal quality look like? Then it has another set of standards that talks about external quality assurance. How should the agencies uh, carry out their processes? And then there is a third one as well, which talks about how do you assure the quality of the quality assurance agencies? So it's, there is something for everyone there. As an institutional actor, you probably don't necessarily always look at this document, but I can assure you that the agencies that you work with, they are looking at this document and you can see the expectations of this document in their criteria for you. Uh, the focus in this document is on education, as I hinted already. I've also listed there are some principles for quality assurance, and one of them is indeed that higher education institutions have primary responsibility for quality and quality assurance. 
And then there are a lot of other uh, principles that I will not get into right now, or not a lot, three others. You can see them on the slide. But I've also promised to the organizers to say a little bit about who is who. The ESG document that I just mentioned, uh, it has been adopted by the ministers for higher education in the European higher education area. Uh, but importantly, it's been drafted by many of the stakeholder organizations that work at the European level. So in a way, it is a document drafted by the stakeholder, uh, by the people involved in quality assurance for themselves and then the ministers have said okay yes we agree with these principles this is what we're going to do the first um est in 2005 it was drafted by so by what is called uh, e4 group and um, then it was reinforced in the next round uh, by three other organizations the e4 group um consists of uh, European University Association, where I come from, we represent universities, ENQA, where Maria, the next speaker, will come from, which represents the politicians agencies, Eurasia, uh, representing the other higher education institutions, uh, more professionally oriented, and then the European Student Union, ESU. Uh, the three other organizations and stakeholders that came into the picture were uh, in, for the drafting of the second version are Education International representing the teachers and Business Europe representing the employers. And then there is one more uh, organization that needs to be highlighted at this stage, which is ECAR, the European Qualitations Register for uh, Higher Education. It is an official list of agencies that work according to the uh, EST. So if you work with an agency that is in ECAR, you can you know that they work according to the standards that are, are outlined in that document. And this is basically some of the key act, list of key actors that are, are behind the, the ru uh, rules for the game we're playing in quality assurance in Europe. And I think this is where I will kind of uh, stop sharing my screen and thank you for your attention. And I hope this kind of set the stage for the next presentations. Thank you so much, Tia. That, that's really interesting. And thank you for providing that sort of overall context for uh, quality assurance in Europe. And your mention of the European standards and guidelines is very important, obviously, as the principal guiding document for all of our work in this field. Um, Tia, I'm going to ask you a question, if I may, about one aspect that you didn't mention in there, but it is to do with your particular organisation, and that's the European University Association. Um, within that uh, work, I think you're the director of the Institutional Evaluation Programme, the IEP. And I wonder if you might like to tell us a little bit more about that particular programme and uh, how that differs perhaps from the work of quality assurance agencies. Well, it is actually a quality assurance agency oh, and, it is, and it is listed in ECAR. <laughs> and so it's <laughs> been recognised as quality assurance agency. But it is a little bit different animal than perhaps many of the quality assurance agencies. In Europe, uh, most of the agencies are national, but our agency is European by definition. Uh, and we, we carry out uh, voluntary institutional evaluations. Um, and actually, I have to say that uh, this program is the, the reason why EUA is so active in, in quality assurance, because our belief really has been uh, from the lessons learned from the what we call IEP, uh, that institutions carry the main responsibility for quality. And we need to take the, the, the responsibility ourselves. Agencies can only support us. And this is how, for instance, our, our evaluators are, are designed. They are supposed to be supportive enhancement-led uh, evaluations. Uh, but, uh, and there was a, if I may say, in the, when it was created, the program, it was kind of said that the people who created it, they, they felt that perhaps this could become a model for other, other agencies as well to be genuinely European and supportive uh, and so on. And um, that has not necessarily happened, but we have seen more and more agencies taking up some of our principles. 
but in that sense, it is really nice to be here right now because music as a uh, agency working in a certain discipline has adopted a lot of the same principles that we've been uh, experimenting for. And it's been uh, nice to have the relationship with, uh, with music in this regard. Thank you. That, that, that's really nice. And uh, yes, I really appreciate that. And the links there are, are, are kind of obvious, I think. I see that there are some questions emerging in the chat function, which we'll come back to later after we've heard all of the three speakers. But I'd like to um, and, uh, encourage you all, please, to uh, put in any questions that you might have, uh, just as they occur to you, whenever they occur to you, in the chat function, and we will come back to them later on. So now I'd like to uh, introduce our second guest speaker today, who is Maria, Ca Maria Callow, who is director of the European Association for Quality Assurance in Higher Education, also known as ENCA, and that's one of the organizations that Tia referred to on her presentation. Maria is a prominent figure in the field of European quality assurance, specializing in themes of internationalization, including transnational education, student mobility, and implementation of the Bologna process. So Maria, thank you very much indeed for being here today, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Gordon, for the kind introduction. I think I'm already sharing, and if, uh, yes, you're nodding, so that's good news for me. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, for Tia, thanks also for having started this off. We, we did coordinate, but there is also some things that I will say that you've already heard. But in Finnish, we say that repetition is the mother of all learning. So I use that uh, excuse of this pedagogical model when I repeat something you might have just heard, but in a bit of a different format. But just quickly before I get into the real business, what is ENQUA? Because I was told not everybody really knows all these um, organizations that all start with an E. We very helpfully call ourselves the E4 because uh, it's all European something. And ours is the Association of Quality Assurance in Higher Education, which really means in practice the organization, membership organization of quality assurance and accreditation agencies. And our key task is to represent those agencies in European policymaking, to support them in their in their work to improve and shape external quality assurance and things like that. It was founded by agencies and it's governed by agencies and it speaks for the agencies uh, and supports them through activities. So it really is a membership organization. And we have over 50 members in over 30 European countries. And when we say European, we refer to the wider European higher education area context, which is the 49 countries at the moment in total. And then we have 55 affiliates from other 12 countries uh, and also international and European organizations. And to be a member uh, in ENQA, the agencies have to go through an external review against these European standards that Tia talked about every five years. And the same criterion applies also for the European Quality Assurance Register, ECHA. And this is just to visually give you an idea of the map. So keep that image in your mind when I move to my next uh, slide, okay, here you see the affiliates, that, that's even wider context. But what really matters is the map of members. And if you look at the map, you see it goes from, from Ireland to, to Kazakhstan and from Finland to Cyprus, etc. So there is a huge diversity. You come from different countries and even in the field of music, and we say music is the common language, it's a universal language, a bit like love. Uh, but I think there is still a lot of diversity in how you approach that universal language. And like Tia was already saying, we have different types of understanding of what quality assurance means. And we also have very different quality assurance agencies that use very different methods. So when we talk about evaluation, audit, accreditation, all of that is part of the bigger heading of quality assurance. Um, we also have program level accreditation, institutional level uh, approaches. Uh, subject specific agencies, multidisciplinary agencies, we have European national regional agencies in the ENQA framework. So also, you know, all this is part of the picture when you talk about what is quality assurance, what is an agency, what is external quality assurance, we might be talking about very different things. And also it's good to remember that outcomes of quality assessments are, are different in different systems. In somewhere, uh, some places, an institution needs to pass accreditation in order to be able simply to operate and award degrees. It might have an impact on funding 
or it could simply be about recommendations for improvement. So no legal consequences. If you don't pass, you're still going to work as you did before. Perhaps you just get a little stain on your immaculate coat and reputation. But so it is. A, so because of all this diversity, it was really necessary for us to have this common framework that Tia referred to common set of standards, a common approach, and common quality assurance register in the European Quality Assurance Register, EQUAR. Um, but let's see a little bit of how far have we got and what has happened in the European higher education area now. Um, and for quality assurance, I can say that quality assurance is one of the success stories of the Bologna process, which is this higher education reform process that we've had since 1999 in, in Europe, with an increasing number of countries joining the process. Uh, and in quality assurance, there have been huge changes. Um, ENQA was founded in, 19, uh, in 2000, so we celebrated our 20th anniversary last year. And in these 20 years of the Bologna process and of ENQA, um, we have really seen a, a dramatic change in the extent to which independent quality assurance agencies have mushroomed across Europe. Still 20 years ago, there were a few of those, but for example, particularly Eastern European countries, Central European countries did not have independent quality assurance agencies, but just maybe departments in the ministry dealing with quality assurance. So uh, now in all countries, almost all countries, we have an internal and external quality assurance system in place. And in many of that, it is aligned with the, with the European standards and guidelines that TI presented to you. Um, and ENQA membership also at the same time has, first I wrote that has grown from about 10 to over 50, but seriously, from the 20 years ago, it has grown from zero to over, six, over 50. Uh, and here is a map that I, I took from the Bologna Process Implementation Report, which is a report prepared by uh, Eurydice Network, um, uh, the European office uh, for the Bologna ministerial conferences that take place every two or three years. And we had our latest meeting in November last year online, unfortunately. And the report data is a little old already by the time it's published, but it does give you a little bit of an idea. Uh, and this uh, map is about the stage of development of QA systems in uh, 2019 in the European higher education area. Uh, and dark green means that you get the fullest possible points in this criterion, which means there is an ESG compliant quality assurance agency in the country, and that's verified through the registration of the agency in the ECAR. And because there is this kind of chain reaction, so if the agency operates in line with the ESG, it means that also the institutions that it accredits or evaluates by, by default, let's say, or by consequence, also comply with the requirements of the ESG. So we could say that the system somehow as a whole complies to that requirement. So it's, it doesn't look too bad. Of course, if you think it's been um, um, 15 years, no, uh, how, how long has it been of the ESG? It has been, yes, about that much. I think we may have lost our connection with Maria there. Uh, um, or maybe it's me. I think, Gordon, it was Maria, but now she seems to be back. Okay, good. Maria, we can see your screen, but we... <laughs> Am I back now? We lost you just for a moment. So. Sorry about that. No so problem. the map is quite quite green. It's quite dark green. The one red spot there is Belarus, uh, where there is no quality assurance system to speak of. But overall, the map uh, map is there, and you can see how it is faring. Um, so orange is that there is a quality assurance system, but it's not aligned with the European standards. So we say that from from the green and even yellow is still still something quite okay. Um, let me see now, I seem to have blocked. Um, one, uh, one of the key, let's say, shortcomings, let's say, or, or the area in which quality assurance has fared least well is the participation of students in external quality assurance. Uh, and this is a bit of a, an issue that we've tried to address uh, better. Um, because uh, despite the repeated efforts and interest in, uh, in involving students better in quality assurance systems, um, it has not really fully taken place in all countries. And in order to get a dark green in this map, 
student needs to be involved in five identified areas, the governance, external review teams, so the panels that go and do the external quality assurance activities, preparation of the institution self-assessment report, in decision-making processes, so in the agency bodies that take decisions on accreditation and quality assurance, and also follow-up procedure. And so countries get a dark green if they comply with all these five areas, they get a light green if with four, etc., down to red, where they don't involve students in any of those areas. So this is just to give you an idea that while we have had a, a robust, and we do have a very robust European quality assurance framework, which gives us a common basis, it's not 100% foolproof uh, implementation yet at the moment. Now with my last minute, I'd like to talk a little bit about cross-border quality assurance because that was identified as a topic of interest for MUSIC. Uh, what we mean by cross-border quality assurance is agencies operating across borders or to turn it around the other way, an institution or program that asks a foreign quality assurance agency to carry out their external quality assurance activity. And there has been a strong political interest in the Bologna process through the ministerial communiques, which are the statements that they make every time they have their ministerial conference, to, to engage and to enhance this element, to have more institutions and programs opt for a foreign agency. Um, and the, the principle is that an institution could choose an agency that best suits their profile from all agencies listed on the European Quality Assurance Register. At the moment, according to the EQUA website, 19 in 19 systems out of these 49 that we have in the European higher education area, all higher education institutions can choose a suitable EQUA listed agency. And not that, out of 49, 19. In 11 systems, they can choose an ECRA listed agency, but they need to follow the national requirements, specific national criteria, for example. But yet 17 countries do not recognize foreign agencies at all as part of the external quality assurance system. So rarely, I would say, an institution is forbidden to ask a foreign agency or a European agency such as MUSIC to accredit their or evaluate their programs. But what the problem is, of course, that often that's not recognized as in place of their national thing. So then they would need to do two. And we are trying to fight against that to make sure that institutions and programs can choose a good agency that suits their purposes, such as, for example, music for music program, without also having to do a national accreditation. So there is still quite some work to do there, but the picture is evolving in a positive direction for sure. And why would, why would um, the institutions be interested in this? I think in the context of music, that's quite obvious. It, it's a small professional community, relatively small. It is this it, it has a specific need for specific expertise and understanding and professional competence. Uh, but for other agencies and institutions, the motivations usually include those related to uh, getting an external perspective, trying something different, um, and sometimes also for simply increasing credibility, perhaps uh, in terms of their national agency maybe not being ESG compliant, for example. Um, but I think every agency and institution, it's a complicated process to use a foreign agency. And therefore we have created together with this all E4 organizations and the ECAR, a document called Key Consideration for Cross-Border Quality Assurance, uh, which can be a guideline for agencies and, and um, institutions. So thank you very much for that and apologies for, for being dropped out for a moment. Thank you so much, Maria. That was really, really helpful. Thank you. And um, it's great to hear your perspective on, on all of these considerations. I just wanted to touch, may, if I may briefly, on the last slide that you showed us there just now, and that point about cross-border uh, quality assurance, because of course, one of the key concepts of MUSIC is that we are able to operate as, a, as a, an organization registered with ECAR, as you mentioned, that we are able to operate cross-border internationally. And of course, we have a a large um, panel of, of uh, peer reviewers who are selected from various countries around Europe and beyond indeed. And I just wondered how ENCA is um, helping to respond to the challenges that you mentioned there of that, as it were, uneven playing field. Uh, you mentioned that some countries it's not possible to choose an international agency, for example. Mm. I think there are two main channels through which we try to improve that. One is the policy channel. So in the Bologna process where ENQA is a party to that, as well as ECAR, we do 
preach this, uh, this good news that should be implemented all across the countries. And there is some political pressure to do that as well. So, so that one thing is the political pressure and the uh, kind of encouragement, which also on the other hand is linked to the second channel that we try to, or second, second method, which is communication. I think in, in many countries, it's not yet well known enough what could first of all be the benefits of that and that this is an actual commitment that has been made by the countries and should be followed up um, and part of that communication i think also and this is my advice always to people to create also pressure from let's say bottom up so i think if institutions and programs keep nagging the ministry and saying we do need to do it that just makes sense you've committed to that you've promised this will be possible you you went there and you you kind of agreed to that now make it possible for us to do that or take part of this uh, development so i think it's a, it's a multi-layer uh, effort Thank you, Maria. And it's very helpful to have that encouragement, actually. And certainly we would um, welcome uh, anybody uh, uh, being present on this webinar today to, to, to engage. I suppose it's all upon us, upon us all rather, to uh, engage with that encouragement of our institutions or indeed of our ministries in our local countries to um, see the benefits, actually, of, of using a subject specific or an international quality assurance agency. Thank you so much for that presentation, Maria. Um, we're going to move on now to our third speaker, who I think, in the context of, of the, this uh, particular webinar, possibly requires no introduction, but I'm going to try and, uh, uh, can, uh, if I can, to introduce and a warm welcome to Martin Prakal, who is um, the founder of Music indeed, and our former chair of the board of Music um, until recently. Martin is the vice principal of the Royal Conservatoire of The Hague and most definitely has guru status in all matters regarding uh, quality assurance in higher music education. And after um, Martin speaks, we'll hear a few words as well from Linda Messas, who is the director of music. So warm welcome to you, Martin. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Gordon. I don't think anybody else has before called me a guru. I mean, it's a new experience for me, for sure. But anyway, I'll try to live up to the um, expectations now. Uh, it's good to see you all, many new people, uh, many old friends. So I'm going to share my uh, presentation with you. Um, I hope this is going to work. There we are. Can you see this? Is it okay? All right, so I'm going to um, share some information with you what this all the information that you've just heard uh, from Tia and uh, from uh, Maria about what this actually means for our sector, uh, higher music education. Um, and as you will see, we have come up with a very uh, sound uh, contribution and solution to all these issues that have been just discussed. Um, here you can see some information about what has happened in the past. So, um, and here, because I've been kind of involved from the beginning, I don't feel a guru, but rather maybe a quality assurance dinosaur, because there you can see that we've been working for uh, almost 20 years to uh, achieve the situation that we're in right now. And it all started uh, in 2002, when we uh, started a project with our American colleagues from NASM. NASM is the National Association of Schools of Music, which is in fact, an American accrediting body in the field of music. And they helped us from the beginning to, uh, to form our thoughts and our ideas on how, on how we could approach um, quality assurance uh, in the field of music in Europe. Um, I saw on the list of participants that Paul Florek from NASM was going to be with us. I, I don't know if, he's, if he has been able to join us, but if so, I would like to uh, you know, welcome him and thank him again for the, the important role that NASM has played in the development uh, of our work. So then afterwards, there were a couple of uh, different projects where we developed, developed criteria, procedures, we did test visits, and this was all still under the umbrella of the AEC. Uh, the AEC took the initiative to do all these projects. It was also part of this big uh, thematic network project, Polyphonia. And this is where all the, the, the developments took place and where all the work was developed over many years. But of course, at some point, the question arose if AEC should be evaluating, accrediting, or reviewing its own members. And this was not found to be very, a very, uh, very good idea. So there was um, uh, an independent organization was established in 2014, which we called Musique, 
and actually quite a few people don't may, maybe don't know that MUSIC is actually an acronym for Music Quality Enhancement. Um, and in 2014, we created this organization um, as an independent body that would then take on this role of the review, accreditation and evaluation of programs and institutions. Um, in 2016, we were also registered on ECAR. This is the organization that Tia was mentioning, the European Quality Assurance Register, um, which means that we are at the European level, we're uh, fully um, uh, uh, formally recognized. And this registration was actually also prolonged in November 2020, and it will be uh, will, so will be on the register until the, the, the um, uh, 2025. Um, it means that basically we have to undergo a review. It's like the reviewer being reviewed uh, every five years, but it's wonderful that we've been able to, uh, to come this far. Um, now, one imp important thing to mention here is that uh, it's uh, the music has come out of the AEC, but we've applied uh, what we call a stakeholders approach. So in the board of, um, uh, of music, and in fact, also the founding members of music, um, where some other organizations were also involved in, uh, in, this, um, in this development. Uh, as you can see, there's some other logos here. There is the um, Euro European Music School Union. There is Pearl, this is the organization of concert halls, theaters, uh, orchestras in Europe. And there is the European Association for Music and Schools. And they're a very important organization because, because they represent the employers in the field of music. And um, as I said, we are now in a situation that music actually represents the training institution, but also the employers in institutions um, at the European level. And they together, they form the board of music and they develop the system of um, uh, review and accreditation. It's very important to have the input of these professional stakeholders in our work because they will be able to tell us what they actually need from the perspective of their own disciplines and of their own um, uh, professions. So just a little bit of an um, uh, explanation on why we think music is important um, to, to, to exist. Uh, there are basically two dimensions. The first one is of course a subject specific one. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that in the beginning of the Bologna process, there was also a feeling of, of, of protection a bit because we were uh, faced uh, with uh, some very um, technocratic approaches to call it to, towards quality assurance that didn't really fit in very well with our type of education. And we found that from our point of view, it was needed to, to take an approach that would a little bit more align with the characteristics of, of, our, of our discipline. Um, I think since then, uh, things have developed quite a bit. I mean, the quality assurance, national quality assurance agencies have also understood this a bit better than, than they used to do. Uh, but still, I think it's important that the subject specific dimension is there because what we try to do is to create a kind of a common language uh, in the field of music of how what we understand with quality issues, what we, feel, what we understand with what quality actually means. And I'm, I'll, I'm, I'm exp I'll explain it in, in a minute. And of course, we are constantly trying to understand and to think of, and of, of approaches on how we can make quality assurance and accreditation more meaningful to our staff and students who are musicians, and they may not be always intimately um, interested or uh, in, uh, informed about what we try to achieve with quality assurance. So we want to always try to improve ourselves on uh, making that more uh, evident for them. There's some critics who say sometimes that, oh, you know, you're just being easy on yourself. So you will be evaluating yourself. It's gonna be much easier when you do it amongst yourself. Well, in fact, I can tell you that I have learned being in both the music context and also in sometimes in the national um, agency context, which is more generic, that in fact, if you go into an institution to evaluate an institution or a program and you know where to look at, sometimes the uh, procedures of music can be slightly more rigorous. And in any case, I think the uh, end result, the, um, the, the recommendations of what, uh, what should be improved, I think are more, much more qualified because we're taking this subject specific approach. So then uh, the second uh, dimension, which we find very important is the international dimension. We operate at the international level. Um, this is uh, also connected to the international reality of our institutions, which have a lot of international students, a lot of international teachers, but it's also because of the international character of our discipline. So this is why it's important to have an international procedure that is now also through the registration on ECAR uh, using internationally recognized standards. 
we have international procedures. Maria was already mentioning this cross-border quality assurance aspect. So this is what we what we do. This, we're basically a cross-border quality assurance agencies. And of course, and this is very important to us, we use international peers. It's very unlikely that there's gonna be somebody from your own country on the panel who will evaluate your program or your institution. And we think this is important because we have access to a wider pool of specialists. There may not always be uh, enough expertise in one country because we're sometimes a small uh, discipline in a small country. And you, you would like to have maybe a little bit more objectivity by involving people from outside the country and also bringing in other perspectives from disciplines that, you know, that, 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 are, that have uh, specialists uh, from, from, from other countries. So uh, this is why we uh, insist also on having international uh, peer review teams. One aspect that we find very important is that we uh, understand each other. Uh, also in the in the area of uh, of uh, quality issues, um, and this is why we are talking about the concept of quality. Now, uh, musicians, and I think probably also artists in a broader sense, they have always been obsessed with quality. In fact, we talk about quality all the time. Um, but what is what kind of quality is that? If, in fact, we were always talking about musical standards. How does somebody play or sing or perform? And there's this other dimension, the educational quality. You know, how is the organization of the curriculum? How are the students given feedback? Can they give feedback? What are, how are the facilities? What are the assessment rules? Maybe these were the aspects that we maybe didn't take that seriously before, um, before the Bologna process started to address these um, issues more consistently. So what we believe as a, as a concept of quality is that we would like to bring those two aspects, musical standards, which is the very basis of our understanding of quality, with this educational quality, and we want to bring them together. And this is also how we approach our reviews uh, when, we, when we do the, uh, of the institutions and of the uh, programs. So we will always ask for uh, the, the um, attendance of, of concerts, of student concerts, of lessons to, to, to have a feeling of the musical standards, but we will also look in all the other educational aspects. If I may give you some examples of how we see this kind of merge of educational quality and artistic standards. For example, on how we do our exams. So for example, the exams, this is where we attest, that we test our artistic and instrumental vocal skills of our students and pupils. And this is of course very important. So what is the artistic quality? And this is a very, actually the main purpose of our training. But there are lots of things that are around it. Are there assessment criteria? Uh, is there equal treatment? What kind of committee is doing the assessment? Is, are there uh, in, only internal, external people? What kind of feedback is being given? All these things are very important to our students. So whenever we go to evaluate a program, we usually uh, we, uh, we um, address or we visit a uh, final recital or an examination. We have to listen to what is going on, but we also go uh, attend the discussion about the assessment of the students. And we really want to make uh, it clear that it comes together, those two elements of artistic standards and uh, educational quality. Another example that I would like to mention is about our teachers. Normally we say, okay, our teachers have to be very wonderful to artists with strong artistic skills and competencies, of course, but how about their didactic skills? And are they also open for continuing professional development? How do we appoint them? All these issues, they also are very important to our education, to our students. And this is another example where uh, we look at on how these artistic standards are being combined with um, uh, educational quality. So uh, another thing that I mentioned at the beginning is that we're constantly looking at uh, new tools um, because we think that we are uh, also uh, ourselves, we have to improve uh, the way we work. And there are many different kind of um, uh, dimensions that uh, I would like to mention. For example, the balance between formal and informal. We are in a discipline that uses a lot of informal uh, contact between teachers and students. We have one-to-one -one, uh, education, for example. So there's a very strong informal uh, culture. How does, this, does that feed in into our quality assurance work? There needs to be a balance of those two. Internal, external. Dia was mentioning that you know, there's external quality assurance that is done by the agencies and internal by the, by the institutions. But in fact, maybe there could be also an internal process with an external component. So I don't think these things should, it could be so separated. It, it could be probably also uh, linked together much stronger. 
qualitative, quantitative, uh, we, we tend to ask, do a lot of surveys in, uh, in quality assurance. Is it not so that we maybe should look for more qualitative uh, tools that could tell us really the experiences of our students on how they experience the studies and, 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 and their education? And for this, we need to be able to speak the language of our students and teachers in these processes. And this is why we have developed this, what we call the critical friend reviews. This is in fact a review where this, uh, a normal review of a team gets preceded by um, uh, individual critical friends who visit the institutions uh, and they're experts in certain fields. It can be jazz, it can be music technology, it can be early music. And they come to the institution and they visit lessons, they talk to students, they talk to the teachers and they speak the language of the particular discipline and then they can come up with very strong recommendations of what needs to be improved. So this is a new kind of form of external quality assurance that is also actually very well connected to the internal processes that we are now testing out in various institutions. So then uh, just to wrap up some of the, um, the, the issues that I just mentioned, these are the music principles. Um, we want to promote and support the, the higher music education sector. We want to work in partnership with stakeholders and institutions. We want to really involve international perspective in quality enhancement. We want to encourage institutions to reflect on their own practices. And we want to respect the values and ethos of each individual institutions and make quality enhancement issues more meaningful to staff and students. And actually the, the issue of respecting the values and ethos of each individual institutions is important for us because we don't want to give the, the, the impression that music is this kind of office in Brussels that decides on what is good and what is bad. It's always connected to the values and to the mission and to the context of the institutions. So here is my last slide. Uh, and I think I've already spoken for too long, but this is what I wanted to mention at the end of my contribution. Um, what is our contribution to, our, to, to the European higher education area and the Bologna process? So basically we are making uh, one of the goals in the Bologna process on cross-border uh, uh, quality assurance um, uh, a reality. Uh, and uh, indeed, as uh, Maria was saying, there's still work to be done. What we, for example, noticed that is in quite, quite a few countries, we are able to operate based on our registration or ECAR, but the institutions have to pay for us, but not for the national agency, which is, you know, a, 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 I think a very strange situation. These, these are still things that need to be addressed, um, uh, I think, at some point to make a level, an equal level playing field. Then, um, what we really find very important is that we move from quality assurance. We always talk about quality assurance. It's a strange word in a way. We would like to move to a shared quality culture, which by the way, is a word that has been thought up by the EUA and maybe by even by Tia herself. And I, I would like maybe at some point to ask her to explain that a little bit more, that we have a shared understanding of what this issue of quality actually is within our, within, within our, uh, within our discipline. And then what we want to ensure is that we move from technocratic approaches to quality assurance to a discourse on the content of our education and of its quality. This is how our students and how our teacher, teachers perceive it. And this is what we have to address. Um, and finally, I think um, we're looking for creative approaches to quality assurance and we provide diversity uh, of approaches and ideas in the whole context of the European quality assurance co uh, uh, arena. Uh, and I think as musicians and artists, I think it's our role also to bring in a little bit of creativity into that, into that, into that world. So if I may be very bold uh, uh, right now, Tia and, uh, and, and Maria, may I suggest that you have this E4, maybe we can make it an E5 uh, and involve uh, music uh, as a kind of um, a subject specific uh, um, organization that will, I'm sure will provide some additional creativity and, and at least ask you some, uh, some unusual questions. Um, so this is what I would like to share with you today. Uh, I'm now handing over to Linda and she's going to tell you a little bit more about uh, the, um, uh, the, the services of uh, what music has to offer. So I'm going to uh, move to the next slide. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, also for the bright conclusion. <laughs> looking forward to hearing some reactions. Uh, so very briefly, I, I want to highlight indeed the diversity of, of services which uh, music is offering to meet the various uh, international needs. So uh, music does not only conduct classical review and accreditation procedures, it can provide an external international dimension 
to existing internal quality assurance systems, it can provide a consultant, it can uh, provide uh, support to coordinate benchmarking projects. Um, important to note also that uh, we review dance programs, not only music ones, despite the name, that's not always well understood. We are used to cooperate indeed with national quality assurance agencies and to conduct joint procedures. And also we regularly work with EQ Arts to review other artistic disciplines. And the philosophy behind all our services is always uh, quality enhancement. As far as the uh, next slide, sorry, Martin. As far as the standards are concerned, uh, again, in order to be uh, as fit for purpose uh, and helpful as possible, um, we are using different sets of standards. Martin, can you? Is it possible for you to move? Uh, it's stuck. It's stuck now. I don't know why. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, that's fine. Uh, so uh, well, it's just a list of the various standards that uh, we are working with. So they have actually been developed by working groups within the AEC community together with uh, EMU and EAS, some of the partners we were mentioning at the beginning, and music is using them for all these different types of procedures. Uh, it's mainly for the use of institutions when they conduct their self-evaluation process and then uh, for the review teams when they review institutions and programs. And they are also used as reference or inspiration when we conduct uh, the other types of services such as benchmarking projects um, or consultancy visits. And just to give you a bit more details about that, final slides. Uh, so the, they are all, all the sets of standards you could see, they're all structured uh, following these eight domains, which you can see. So you can see uh, what is covered in a, in a review. Uh, we are actually working on revising them. So may, maybe this will change, but of course the, the domains will not uh, change themselves. Um, they have been mapped uh, with the European standards and guidelines, uh, which Tia was referring to uh, in her presentation. Uh, the domains themselves, they look uh, quite generic, but they all have um, a music specific translation uh, through a long list of uh, indicative questions. And also uh, we have in total about 17 standards, which uh, in encourage the, the self-reflection of institutions. So I just wanted to give some clarity about that. And uh, otherwise, uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion or you will also find some further information on our website. Thank you. Thank you so much both to Martin and to Linda for sharing with us there about music and its particular approach to quality enhancement, quality assurance in the context of this of this discussion today, uh, quality assurance in Europe. Thank you both very much indeed. Um, I, one of the one of the principles that uh, I think Maria referred to earlier was that of independence, and I just wanted to light on that uh, to introduce um, one of the participants who's here today um, to respond to a particular question, and then we'll come back to some more general issues which have been already highlighted in the presentations today. Um, so this principle of independence is is really important in quality assurance, especially for quality assurance agencies as they work with institutions uh, in quality enhancement and accreditation. Uh, Stefan Gies is the chief executive of the European Association of Conservatoires or the AEC. And I wonder, Stefan, if you could unmute for a moment and perhaps say a few words about um, the distinctive roles uh, uh, played by AEC and by Musique in this context. Stefan, if you're there. Yeah, I'm here. Uh... Great. Thanks for that, and um, good to see you. Good to see you, Gordon, and on so many known faces, and even better to see some uh, not known faces. So the community is growing. Uh, yeah, and there a lot of, of things have already been said, and uh, maybe I start by just saying, I mean, AEC and music have a particular relationship, that's true, but AEC is much older, uh, more than 70 years old, or no, almost 70 years old. And uh, AEC is a voluntary association bringing together higher music education institutions from all across Europe and beyond. And our main, uh, just a couple of keywords, uh, our main activities are networking, advocacy. Uh, we are organizing a lot of events 
And it's, it's a kind of meeting place and sometimes maybe also a marketplace to exchange experiences and good practice. And QA activities, quality assurance activities have been uh, at our agenda, uh, at least from 1999, when the famous Bologna Declaration was signed and launched. And in, over the years, it grew bigger and bigger. And if I remind going way years back, and I was part of, of one of the first working groups almost 15 years ago, and this is when I came in touch with AEC, by the way. Um, some important steps have been sectoral European qualification framework, which was published uh, under the Polyphonia program, uh, describing uh, discipline specific learning outcomes. Then we were dealing with mobility, with joint programs, with bringing international examiners, for example. And this ended up in 2014 uh, by founding music as an independent body. You could also say it's, it's AC gave first to uh, music or outsourced this, uh, uh, this part of, of, the, of the quality assurance business. And uh, I think it was, so to say, a logical step at that time. It was also a necessary step. Why necessary? Because as Gordon pointed drop for right out, independence is key for any kind of quality assurance exercise. And uh, this is also uh, always a challenge. And I do not talk about only about music and AC, but if, if any kind of uh, quality assurance, because on the one hand, you want to rely for good reasons on peers. Uh, the basic idea is that the evaluation as such should be done based on uh, the assessment of a peer-to-peer -peer evaluation. And this is also crucial because what you need is people who know the business, who are familiar and who is more familiar than those who are doing the same job. And, but the risk or the tendency that's always there is also that all these peers have the similar background, similar mindset, similar experiences, similar convictions uh, as those they are, so to say, evaluating. And they might tend to spend their lives in, as professionals in the same bubble. There are so many bubbles outside and they are all for coming from the same bubble and getting back to the same bubble. So this is, so to say, a challenge, uh, which is uh, every kind of uh, quality assurance uh, process have to face. And if you look at uh, how they deal with that uh, point, uh, whatever, whenever it's done in whatever discipline, uh, in the university sector or in the higher education sector, uh, for example, in the, in the national agencies, and there's still many countries where it's much monopolized inside one country, they try, for example, to have peers who are uh, living uh, at least 100 kilometers uh, remote from the, the place where it is, and these kind of things. And we do it by, uh, by having it very international, and at the same time, by really dividing the responsibility of having two completely independent offices and uh, business that are run. And that's important. And it's, it's, you can also say a comparison for if you, if you look at any quality assurance process in any industrial manufacturing process, uh, the one who produces the car is never the same one as the one who checks the car, but both of them have to be experts in the field. And uh, that's basically what we did, uh, or that's why this step to divide AC and Wizzy was such important at a certain uh, point, because if you wanted to continue, that was our conviction, having uh, and music specific quality enhancement or assurance process to run it longer, we had to do that point. And I think it worked out um, very well, I have to say, because what, what the state is now after seven, eight years is that the contact which is necessary is still, the, is still there. We are in contact, but the in, independency of, uh, in particular, if it's about uh, making decisions is also still there. And I think th this is really, uh, I would say um, a success story, uh, even if you look at, uh, at, at other kind of, of fields, uh, we did well. And uh, you know, for example, if you, you, you can, uh, even if we would uh, do like Boeing uh, and mixing this up, uh, we, we are not at risk that uh, the, the airplanes fall down from the sky, but still uh, we take care of uh, that we uh, keep this independence. So, and if, if I talk uh, just to uh, at the way end, uh, to let you know the, the things that are still mutual contributing is, I mean, what can AEC still do for, for music in a, uh, in a daily 
business, so to say, we are involved in uh, capacity building. And for first of all, we are AC has ever been in the, still a think tank. It was about developing new uh, things and also reacting on new movements outside of the field. And this is, of course, AC the think tank, but feeding in with its outcome also uh, with its outcome that are beneficial for the quality assurance as well. The other way around. And music is not only doing formal processes, but uh, conducting reviews, uh, for example, and, and giving advice, supporting institution, and which is more in an informal way. And there is the need of keeping the independency is not such strong. Uh, and, and that's still good to, uh, to be in steady contact with each other uh, to make this kind of business more beneficial. Maybe I, I stop here, but I would just take the opportunity because there has been in the, in the chat, I saw uh, one question, which is, uh, as I saw, no, not yet answered about uh, the role of the students. And I have to say that students are in music as in most other or any other uh, evaluation peer um, uh, groups, and they are involved in that. So there's always a student involved in the, in the committees. And that's why, uh, of course, it's also important uh, for us, I would say, as AEC and as MUSIC, to keep them on track and to update them and involve them, not only informing them, but also taking, uh, taking them along as uh, as important voice when it's about uh, decision making. Um, yeah, I will stop here. Thank you so much, Stefan. It's really great to hear from you. And of course, we work very closely with all of our stakeholder organizations and AEC is a very important partner in our work. So thank you very much for that um, introduction to AEC and to the relationship that we have with uh, AEC and their members. Thank you. Um, now, I have the honorable task of, of, uh, um, of, uh, of facilitating discussion around all of these issues. And I do see that there are some questions in the chat function, but I would really appreciate it if any of you can contribute some more questions to that and we will try and get to as many of these as we possibly can so please if anything occurs to you or has occurred to you and you've just been too scared to write it down don't worry about it at all please just write it down and we'll get to it I'll paraphrase if I need to that's absolutely fine um, I would like to begin actually by asking our panelists a little bit more about this concept of, of um, well, two things actually, but I'll take the segue from, uh, from Stefan there. In terms of student engagement, Mar Maria, this was one of the things that you showed on your slides uh, in terms of the differing levels of where um, different countries in Europe are at in terms of their um, student engagement and quality, both internal and external quality assurance. And I wonder if you might like to say a little bit more about that and particularly why we as, uh, uh, um, as people engaged in quality assurance, why we feel it's important that we engage students in this. Mm. Um, thank, thank you very much. That's uh, almost like a trick question. Sounds like it, but uh, I know it's not. I, I think it's uh, it's it's simply a very normal thing to involve in it discussions about quality. I would, I would like to focus on that really because I think involvement in quality assurance processes is happening quite a lot. Um, but often what we hear is that it's not the qualitative uh, contribution or qualitative engagement of students. So what I'd like to see more is a really qualitative engagement of students in discussions about quality and what is quality for them, what are their expectations and how that quality can be improved. Um, the, the, the students are the ones who benefit from that, uh, the, the education that is provided and if they do not benefit then there is a problem. And how do you know if they benefit or not? It's, it's really only either guesswork or you have to ask them. Uh, and I think students have a lot of possibilities and power also to contribute to the enhancement element. So give useful ideas on how to move forward. Now, it's not very simple to involve students for many reasons. You have to first convince the students that it, it, it's something interesting for them. Uh, and the student life cycle, so to say, is relatively short. Uh, so by the time they see the changes made, they are out of the system already. So give that message to students. You're not doing this for yourself. You do this for the next generation of students, first of all. Then students need to see that there is some impact in their contribution. It is very frustrating for students to fill in, for example, evaluation forms at the end of each program. And then those forms end up in a kind of black hole 
And nobody knows if anybody read them, if anybody reflected on them, and if any change was done as a consequence. And it was very interesting. I once spoke with a Swedish student and he said, Look, we, we organize in our university a session where when, you know, when we get feedback on the feedback on the feedback that we gave as students to the institution and they tell us what they are going to do and why. And they also tell us what they are not going to do out of those things we wanted them to do and why. Because there can be also good reasons. It's not that an institution has to do everything the students want. Um, parents do everything and don't do everything their children want. Uh, uh, so. It's of course a different relationship, sorry for the, the comparison. But what I mean is that it is important to know that there was a meaning in all of that engagement. Uh, and maybe the third point here, I'd say, uh, another frustration that I've heard many times from students is that they are a token presence. They are in the, in the internal quality management board. They sit in the number of meetings, but there is no real interest or engagement. So that the, the institution or the agencies as well, by the way, can tick the box. We have a student. Yes, yes, we've always had a student. Um, do you actually listen to that? Do the students feel that their voice is heard? Uh, and that at the, at the end is what really matters. So there's a lot of um, structured uh, elements in that. It's not so simple as to just coldly say whether students are in or not. So a common, look, there has to be a lot of communication, I think, in all sides uh, about this. Thank you. I think that's really interesting. Um, well, I should say as well that one of the future webinars uh, in this series will actually focus on that very question of student engagement in QA. So maybe um, anybody participating today might wish to come along to that particular topic and learn more about it in more detail then. Um, Martin or Tia, is there anything before we move on to our next question that you would like to add to what Maria has said there about student engagement before we move on? But no, nope, that was a great answer. Thank you so much, Maria. That was really good. Um, I'd like to uh, turn to a question that Martin himself posed actually in the chat, which was to do with quality culture and this concept. And, and this time I'm going to turn to Maria, uh, sorry, to Tia, because you, you referenced this quality culture. And I'd like to also bring in the other phrase that we've heard today, uh, or two phrases rather. One is quality assurance, which we've been using you know, consistently throughout this, but also quality enhancement, which we have been using and touching upon at various times. And uh, Tia, I'd re really be interested in, your, uh, in, in what you mean or what the EUA means by this concept of quality culture. Thank you, Gordon. And uh, thank you, Martin, for probing me. Uh, and uh, the comment to Martin's presentation, uh, I am not quite old enough to have been there to start EUA's quality culture work. I cannot take, uh, take uh, uh, credit for that, but uh, I, I have to say that, for instance, for me, the first time I started to work on quality assurance back at the university, uh, get, uh, receiving EUA's first quality culture publication on my desk, I thought, oh, this is it. This is what I've been struggling with in my work. And I was so happy that I wasn't the only one. Uh, so the relationship between quality culture and quality assurance. Well, first of all, quality assurance, as we all know, and uh, uh, is quite, and, and the question that was posed in the beginning in the poll, uh, it's quite often seen as bureaucratic exercise. So the way we understand is that quality assurance processes are the formal processes that we have to put in place uh, as an organization so that we are working in a professional manner. We have strategies, we have processes defined, how, how should things happen? These kind of um, educational quality examples that, uh, that Martin was saying, uh, saying. But then there is a large realization from already, for instance, back in the day when I worked on quality assurance or started working on it, that just by putting in place these procedures and giving our teachers and our students our regulations and, and so on, that's not going to really necessarily help the quality of what we're delivering. So we need a culture. So you need to combine the processes, quality assurance processes, with the cultural commitment and the ownership of the staff, the students, the, the leadership as well. So it should be kind of our, in our uh, um, 
kind of mentality and how we approach our work. For instance, in music, that's that's then probably the artistic quality. There is no question that a musician is not you know thriving for a high quality music when they are doing it. So the the quality culture from our side has been a concept that combines both the cultural um, um, emotional elements towards quality but also the processes. Because I remember back in the day, I used to get these comments that, oh, you just say you want just culture. So that means you don't want to do the hard work. So we've said, no, it, there is a hard work there as well. But then the third concept of equality enhancement, what's the relationship between quality assurance and quality enhancement? I actually, if I had to say be self-critical i would have wouldn't have used so much the word quality assurance i think the people who develop this this business of ours probably made a little bit of a mistake there because assurance in is not always a positive thing and people think that it does mean only uh minimum standards and assuring that everybody does what they're supposed to do and it's not forward looking um but okay we are in a way stuck with this uh, word of quality, a term of quality assurance, but the way we understand it, at least in the ESG and also in, in our work typically is that it also uh, covers enhancement. So it has quality assurance, weirdly enough, is, a, is an umbrella term for assurance and enhancement. And you need both in order for it to be uh, meaningful. For instance, it was clear from what Maria just said about this, that the student motivation comes from the fact that they see some enhancement, uh, some improvement in, in their environment. So I think it is, a, they are all important and we should kind of, maybe we should start to talk about them as a triangle sometimes now, as I think of it, as I'm saying it. Thank you. Uh, that, that's really lovely, actually, that idea of those three things being interrelated and, in a, in a sense, interdependent as well. Martin, uh, I, I'm just conscious of what uh, how, how um, Tia described quality culture there and it, uh, reflecting back on some of the slides that you were sharing with us a moment ago, you talked about uh, the assessment of musical standards, but you also talked about the assessment or the evaluation of quality in terms of the educational process and the marrying of those two. And it sounds to me as though what uh, what Tia is describing as quality culture is very much that marriage of those two aspects. How, how would you respond to that? No, I, I, I totally agree. And I, I think it's what the, the word culture kind of implies that you have more people, the more stakeholders that are involved and that understand what this is all about. And I think this is, and, and actually, I, I, if people haven't looked it up already, but I would like advise everybody to look at the definition of uh, quality culture that the EUA has, has developed, has written down already quite some years ago. I think it's perfect because it really describes on what it should be. Um, I think it's very important to, to create this culture because then everybody is also understanding that we are really trying to move towards the improvement and enhance, enhancement of everything that we do. And if, if this understanding is not there and we really only seek to, to achieve some kind of compliance to rules that are imposed on us, then I think it's a, it's a lost exercise. So I, I, I'm really a big fan of how the EUA has described, described this, this phenomenon. And I think actually in music, we live by this, by this philosophy. Thanks, Martin. And, and actually sort of flowing on from that, there was something that you mentioned in your slides as well, which uh, caught my imagination and might be helpful for all of the listeners today. And that is to do with the concept, I think you, you said the discourse on the content of our education. And I, I think that one of the elements of quality enhancement, at least as far as I understand it, is that we as as experts, we engage in helping uh, people who are experts in their own institutions to enhance what they do, but also by learning from their experience to enhance what we do as well. And there is a sense, therefore, that quality enhancement is not just something that is done to an institution, but it actually is a joint venture by all those who are engaged in it. I, and I'd, I'd like to uh, hear from any of our panelists really about that, that idea, Tia. I, I think you are absolutely right. When we ask, for instance, our reviewers in our institutional evaluation program, why, why do they do it? Because we really don't pay high fees. 
it's a voluntary task that they do. And the, what comes up constantly is that uh, it's it's a two way street that the reviewers or, or our evaluators feel that they are learning from the institution and they are and they are learning from each other because they come uh, from different contexts, as you you described in that you do it in music. By the way, your principles of uh, are so similar to ours. They are just translated to music uh, uh, in context. So I, I think it's it's nice to hear. Um, but so it is. I think we often focus on the fact that the impact of an evaluation on external quality assurance exercise is on the institution subject to that exercise. But I, I would indeed underline that what we are doing, we're creating also a culture among our reviewers and, uh, and, and the communities. Um, and this is probably why what we see right now is that there are more and more agencies who are moving towards the enhancement uh, uh, approach. Uh, there was a debate uh, in the early days of quality assurance, do you do enhancement or, uh, or minimum standards? And at that time, it was often said that accreditation is about minimum standards and nothing more. But there you understood that, okay, nobody benefits from this if we don't even try to think of something new and uh, support each other uh, going forward. So I think the the while being external, the, the, the idea of being a part of the same community is, is important so that we can move things forward. And I think that one of the, uh, one of the other uh, aspects that both Marie, um, Martin and Linda spoke about is that of critical friend. And I think that that word almost encapsulates the idea of enhancement and peer review uh, and the sharing of the discourse that we've been discussing there just now. So that, that's an important aspect of it as well. Thank you so much for your responses there. Um, I haven't received any more questions in the chat, but I wonder if there are any more that we can uh, tackle in the last few moments of this discussion. Um, Tia. Can I comment on something that Martin uh, had on the slide? And I think it was so nicely going back to the, what you already raised this artistic quality and educational quality. The way you were explaining it, it made me really think of the discussions we've had at EUA when we talk about uh, the quality assurance of doctoral uh, programs, where we also have the same discussion that uh, it's a uh, there are two different types of qual aspects of quality in our in doctoral education. We have the kind of the uh, the scientific quality, and uh, when we talk to those who offer doctoral education, we often need to explain this that okay, there is a scientific uh, uh, quality that you check by checking the final thesis because this is what we used to get always. Oh, you know, the final thesis is the quality assurance, and then you say, but there is so much so much that happens on the way to getting to that point with the doctoral candidate that you know you need to look at those aspects as well so it, it, it it's interesting that you can translate that separation to different kind of contexts and and also shows how many kinds of quality uh, we have that's really uh, thank you very much that leads me naturally to a further question that I think I think which has been posed by Martin which is you know we, we're, we're all developing what we do how we assess that's really what you're speaking about Tia I think in terms of recognizing the journey taken by a PhD student or a, or a doctoral student of some kind um, but that leads me to uh, the question that Martin posed there which is what are the sort of future developments that might be in train uh, in both of your organizations and in terms in broader terms in terms of uh, European quality assurance. So uh, this is one for perhaps Maria to begin with. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that's the crystal ball moment. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that, well, there, there is a lot of European developments going on at the moment. Martin wrote there about the European education area into which we haven't really got uh, as ENQA uh, for the moment, but we will have to. Uh, but there is the European Universities Initiative that you might have heard of, uh, kind of more intense collaboration between universities. How do we address quality assurance in that context? Context. Then uh, one of the buzzwords of the past 15 months or so has been micro-credentials. So that's what a lot of people are talking about. How can you, how can you enhance, have more of these seemingly very useful short snippets of learning that people should be able to then have a qualification for or kind of certificate to demonstrate that they've learned something about something 
uh, in a certain period of time. So we also look at that. But I think those are kind of all very technical, practical things. I think the big picture that keeps nagging on us um, is what is all this for? Um, and so kind of the question of fitness for purpose keeps coming up. Mm -hmm. To what extent external quality assurance should intervene? Uh, and I often talk about this quality assurance pendulum. It's not my invention. I, I stole it from somebody and I'm, I'm afraid I don't even know who anymore. But we see that development in systems that it goes from a kind of stricter, more closer look at program, more intervention interventionist approach, perhaps in more mature system to letting the institutions have more freedom, uh, have more focus on the internal quality assurance and external quality assurance being like a, a critical friend support, push, pull a little bit, you know, guiding the direction. Um, and I think that's one of the big questions now. Okay, as the systems mature, and we saw in the map, uh, Europe is being colored by green. So developments are positive in that sense. We all have the same common system. We understand each other. What is the next step? Uh, and to what extent external quality assurance as we have known it with this very regular, every five, seven years going and checking a lot of uh, things will be really, um, necessary and the fruitful approach. Uh, so, so I think that's the more of the micro picture that I'm personally asking myself questions about. Thank you. Tia, would you like to uh, have any thoughts on that question as well? Well, a lot of the things that Maria was uh, listing are the, are the same that we are looking at uh, at EUA and from the, from the university perspective. And I think the the question about what kind of external quality assurance we have in the future, I, I trust it will be a big, uh, big topic uh, for the next couple of years, and uh, we'll see if uh, changes happen. But then again, I, it's we haven't seen anyone come up with uh, very credible alternatives either. But that doesn't still mean that we we shouldn't be evolving so to keep so to stay fit for purpose. Uh, the European University Initiative and European Education Area discussions have brought up uh, uh, quality assurance uh, again as a challenge. Uh, and uh, that is largely due to the joint programs that uh, these alliances are, are expected to uh, develop. And of course, when you develop a new joint program, you realize that you are all uh, partners, you are under different regulations and different, for instance, program accreditation rules and so on. Uh, this is not new for us who, who may, may have worked with quality assurance or worked with joint programs. We've known that these differences that Maria also described earlier, they exist. And then you have to try to juggle them. But it, it looks to us uh, from EU side that uh, the political pressure towards some, doing something about this is now increasing. The, we do have a tool for that. Uh, the ministers uh, in the European higher education area have already adopted a European approach for quality assurance of joint programs, but it's not being implemented quite to the, to the level that, that would allow the institutions to do joint programs without uh, additional bureaucratic burden. But what we, what we see is that uh, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel in this regard, for instance, it would be better to put in place uh, the, you know, the implement what, we, what uh, was already agreed in that European approach document. And then on the other hand, the cross-border quality assurance might be also facilitate uh, this. So we, we do expect that these are issues that are not going to disappear as long as we have this initiative. Uh, and in that sense, it may be shaking our field as well. Thank you. Thank you both very much indeed. Martin, do you have any final reflections on those issues? Not really, actually. It was very fascinating to hear what uh, Maria and Tia were saying. And I, I think it's wonderful that they were able to join us and it just you know, to give us the broader perspective. So thank you for that. Thank you. Well, in the final few moments of this uh, webinar, I'd just like to pay a huge tribute to our three guest speakers, uh, to Martin Pakal, to Maria Kello, and to Tia Lokanen, uh, Lokala, sorry. Thank you both. Uh, thank, you, thank you all very much indeed. And also to, uh, to Linda and to Stefan for sharing your um, wisdom and uh, initiatives as well. 
Um, just to finish off uh, the session today, um, this webinar is being recorded, as you know, so this will be available on the Musique website in due course. Um, please do look at our Facebook page and our Twitter account as well to keep abreast of all of the developments that we have in Musique. And of course, I mentioned at the beginning that we have two more webinars lined up for the autumn. And I'd just like to share with you now um, the, the topics of those. And uh, we don't have the dates for them yet, but they will be announced on our website and on our Facebook page. But one is going to be balancing internal and external quality assurance, and that will be a sharing of the experiences of various higher music education institutions. So please do come along and share your experience of that. And the second one, uh, the third rather in total, will be uh, involving students in quality assurance and again sharing practices in higher music education institutions. We very much hope that we'll have a good student audience for that, but also um, a good audience from the managers and leaders in higher education institutions as well. Um, there will be a feedback questionnaire which will be sent around to you by email after today's webinar and we would very much appreciate it if you could um, fill that in, send it back to us and we will hope very much to learn from the experience of this, our, our first webinar, uh, to improve our future ones, internal quality assurance there in action. I really uh, want to thank you all for participating in this. It was wonderful to see so many people from so many different areas of Europe joining us today. It's very important that we feel part of that general discourse uh, about quality insurance, uh, quality assurance, but also quality enhancement, and that we participate in this whole um, idea of quality culture, which we spoke about in the discussion. Thank you all very much for your questions, and I hope that you have a very good afternoon and remainder of the day. Thank you very much indeed, and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, and bye.